to sit here with Carolyn Evans Shabazz and Jean Locke right across from me. Today we're going to be discussing a little bit about black pro progression and their goals to achieve that. You ready? Ready. All right. Ready. All right. Give me a brief background story of who you are. Who wants to go first? I can. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I consider myself to be fortunate to be oh. able to sit here and I'm humbled and honored to be the council member for District D, mm -hmm. what I call the District of Destination. Okay. And certainly I've lived in the district all of my life. I am a um, proud graduate of Jack Yates High School. And then I went on to Spelman College in Atlanta, Georgia came back and got a master's and a doctorate at Texas Southern University. Mm -hmm. So I've been very deeply ingrained in the community. Mm -hmm. uh, my father was a basketball coach, high school basketball coach at Jack Yates. And, and so I've been running around Jack Yates in this area all my life, basically. Now in my um, career, I worked actually at Worthing High School mm -hmm. and uh, other communities in District D. So I'm very knowledgeable of the, the culture and the people there. and and I deeply love them. And so um, I became involved in politics. I actually ran for city council at large in 2015. Mm -hmm. I retired from the Houston Independent School District where I was a, a diagnostician. I test special ed children and uh, decided that I was gonna retire and became the education chair of the NAACP Houston branch. And then some people say I didn't have sense enough to sit down after I, uh, retired and I then ran for city council at large, uh, which I didn't win, but I did because I met so many wonderful people, uh, was able to engage with a lot of people who can g give resources in my current position and, and actually had a tremendous relationship with the incumbent who did win, uh, Mr. Jack Christie. And so, uh, after that, I later was, uh, allowed, and I always say allowed because I'm very humbled and I'm very appreciative, uh, to that. become a trustee for the Houston Community College, uh, representing District 4, which again is in this area. And um, I later became the, the first African-American female chairman of the board. And education has always been a great part of my life. Um, and just my grandfather was the first president of Prairie View a and University. And uh, besides having two parents who were educators, uh, I had no idea that I would go into education, but I did. And I've been very fulfilled for doing so. But in that capacity, education is so very important to me. Uh, and then the opportunity came to, uh, to me to become the council member for the District of Destination. And so education is always, as I said, a great passion for me because I believe that people uh, need to have these opportunities. And I want to be very clear. I'm not saying that they have to go get a college degree. I'm saying that they need to be prepared, be it a certificate, some kind of skill, because I always tell people that it's not about uh, just having a degree, even though, you know, that's a great thing. I, you know, I have this terminal degree, but certainly I have so much respect and treasure people who are in the industries and in the trades. I can't fix my own car. Mm -hmm. I can't uh, do a whole lot of things that people can do mm -hmm. and they can become entrepreneurs in that. Mm -hmm. Other than education, you kind of have a ceiling and yep. people with degrees sometimes don't make the money and are able to take care of their families mm -hmm. in the same manner that those that go into the trades. True. And so that's very important to me. Now, as the council member of District D, we have a lot of challenges. Um, certainly the crime, uh, those are things that we uh, get information about. And I almost cringe at night when I'm looking at the news and I hear that someone anywhere in the city, but particularly in District D, uh, died or was hurt or anything like that. Uh, and so that really, really bothers me. And certainly we have engaged with the ministers and I'm also engaged with uh, a couple of people who run uh, gang organizations to help people to change their lives. And so I'm very engaged in that. And I'm always ready to try to help people to navigate their way out of a bad situation, which sometimes attributes to them ending up getting in trouble. Mm -hmm. 
And so certainly that we have this big problem with trash in the city. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have people who have not changed their mindset to realize that godliness and cleanliness are in the same realm. And so they consequently, they put down a lot of trash mm -hmm. and expect everybody to come and pick it up. The city, of course, is not uh, able in all aspects to do it. I, I do have a, a hot team uh, through uh, council district service funds to uh, send out, I have four guys, which could be a lady as well, I'm just guys, right. no gender, right. uh, two trucks and two trailers. And they actually go out to address uh, personally some of these dumped areas. So those are two of uh, the major things mm -hmm. that I'm interested in, in making an impact with. And so, I mean, again, you know, I tell people that they can perhaps, maybe they can outrun me, they can outtalk me, but they cannot outlove me. Mm. I love the people that I work for. Mm -hmm. And uh, I believe that that is my calling. And I'm very, very humbled and appreciative of being able to serve in that capacity. Oh, well, thank you. Thank what you. What about you, Gene Locke? Well, uh, I'm originally from East Texas, mm -hmm. came to Houston to go to the University of Houston. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. And when I got here, we couldn't say Go Cougs because that was a clear mark of demarcation between the white institution mm -hmm. we were attending and the segregated life that we were leaving. Mm -hmm. That led me to a, a path of political resistance. I was at the University of Houston, I became a student activist and a political activist. And uh, we helped to make a lot of changes at the university. but. It's a course of that, uh, you know, all, a lot of us paid a lot of price for it. Yeah. I continued my life as a really a political activist, community organizer, and almost a national uh, organizer. I, I ran a, uh, a school for community organizers in Houston in Third Ward called the Lynn Usain Institute. Yeah. Organized national demonstrations across the country. A lot of it with the support of Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church. By yeah, the way. That. Uh, when I was arrested uh, and charged with inciting the riot, the church came to my defense and helped to really? pay the uh, legal fees that uh, helped to ultimately uh, allow me to be sitting here. And I'm eternally grateful for it. Uh, I, I spent my early adult life as a political activist. But How old life, were you when you got arrested? Sorry to cut you off. but I, This was 1969. I was arrested at the University of Houston, charged with inciting the riot and uh, the we were trying to put through a number of demands at the university, an African-American studies program, more student, uh, more uh, faculty that's minority and women, student loans and, and adequate pay for the janitors and the, 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 the housekeepers there who were, who were black primarily. Uh, the price that I had to pay obviously was the university had to punish somebody, mm -hmm. and not the university, but the city and the state had to punish somebody who had to the, the goal to challenge the status quo. Uh, but anyway, to, to shorten my lot, long life story, uh, as a political activist in the early part of my life, I really wanted to be a lawyer. And ultimately, uh, I found myself in a position where I was working a rotating shift in an oil refinery, but I got admitted to South Texas College of Law. It took me four years to get through working uh, as I was working full time. But I got through, became a lawyer, and devoted my practice primarily to helping people and serving people. Uh, first, uh, as just handling people's everyday problems and doing a lot of civil rights litigation. And then I uh, got an opportunity to be city attorney uh, for the city of Houston. And that was followed by a lawyer representing most of the major governmental institutions in Houston, the, the school district, the community college, the county, the city, on and on. And, and, and I really enjoyed that, and I tried to use those positions as lawyers for those institutions to make change. And uh, now I'm just kind of sitting back in a, a semi-retired status, uh, trying to uh, enjoy my family and uh, take, 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 take together everything that has done and trying to project everything that needs to be done going forward. The work never stops. Can I just say, of I, course. Just, I am so supremely 
grateful and, and uh, just for the relationship that I have with this gentleman. Mm -hmm. He is, he's being a little modest. He was a legend, uh, isn't a, a legend. And actually he just, he has the, the, the servant's heart, mm -hmm. which is so very important. And we've had a tremendous opportunity to, to talk to mm -hmm. just today. Mm -hmm. And I am just want to tell you, I'm really grateful Thank for you. the conversation. Thank you, Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. So yeah. as it relates to black progression, what area of interest are you most passionate about? You want to answer first since she went well, first well, the last well, time? I mean, Carolyn started with education. Mm -hmm. I, I think an educated black world will allow us to advance. Mm -hmm. I think also a financially empowered black world will make us advance. Mm -hmm. And also I think a self, not self, a service black community will help us to advance. So there's three things that I'm saying. I, I would focus on education mm -hmm. And, and making sure that we get all of the opportunities. And I think Carolyn get it on the head when she explained all of those opportunities. We just need to do a better job of making sure. As we talk to young people, mm -hmm. and as I talk to them, every day should be a learning experience. And, and, and there are skills that you need in life that have to be cared for. So education, I push. Economic empowerment, mm -hmm. uh, uh, it's a big term but it basically means let's make sure that we keep resources moving to move the community forward. And then, you know, uh, service is just that. Being humble enough as a people to make sure we've got so far to go and we can't get there unless we help each other along the way. And so this is not one crab who's trying to climb to the top right. of the barrel. Right. This is all of us trying to get out of this monster that we call America. What steps can we take toward that financial empowerment goal? I'm sorry? What are the steps that we can take towards reaching that financial empowerment goal? Oh, there are so many. We yeah. just don't have time to talk about you all of them. You can name about two. <laughs> but it, it starts with trying to make sure that we support businesses, people who look like us, okay. and create opportunities. And so uh, the, the council member has done a great job with other council members of the city to maintain a, 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 what I call an affirmative action program, but an economic opportunity program where small business, particularly women-owned and minority-owned mm -hmm. black businesses, can get opportunities to do work there. But we need to spend our money in places where it will do good for us. The dollar will come back. So that's one thing that we can do. The other thing that we, I think, have to instill in all of us is the understanding that every dollar that we have has to be put to some use. If it's put to a, a use of making us feel good, it just makes us feel good. Right. It's if temporary. It, if it's put to a use of improving people's lives, mm. that's a productive use. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, again, I, I can't stress how important education is, but in regards to engaging with young people, I say this all the time, and some people have probably heard this. Never let anybody tell you you are not college material. Hmm. That just really cuts to my heart because what you have done, you have deflated somebody. Mm -hmm. And when I say college material, college to me is anything past high school that prepares you to be able to take care of your families. But when you put people in a position of thinking that they're less than, then they don't sometimes strive to their capabilities. Because I think everybody has a niche, everybody has something that they can do well in, and sometimes those areas progress to economic impact for their families. And so I'm gonna caution parents, you know, because that's so vitally important to lift up the self-esteem of our children and making those kinds of statements don't feel good. And you've heard many people say, oh, they told me I couldn't do this. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it, it serves as the impetus for them to do better, but it doesn't always work out that way. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it deflates people and they determine that they're not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. And so we need to make a concerted effort. I always try to make an effort to lift somebody up. 
you know, just as, I mean, those shoes are beautiful <laughs> or something as, as maybe mundane yeah. as that. But people like to hear positive feedback. They may not be having such a great day. Right. And to hear you say, I love your smile or I like your hair or just, I don't mean any false hoods, but I certainly mean that if you can, I think you can find something good in Absolutely. everybody to be able to comment. And so that point right there, we need to lift up our young people in particular and everybody so that they can strive to take advantage of some of the ec economic opportunities. Because here again, we do have these banters back and forth in council about what percentage of engagement uh, for uh, minority businesses. And it's very important because uh, people need to be able to access. And in saying that, uh, really in the spring, I am actually going to have a conference somewhat to help people to learn how they can engage yes. with governmental entities. Because a lot of people say, we're locked out, we don't get a chance. And it's basically not because you don't do great business, it's because you don't have the paperwork or the ability right. to do the paperwork to help you to be able to engage. Because there are a, a countless contracts that come forward and you know, I don't want minorities to always just be subcontractors. I want them to be the principal yeah. on some uh, things. But certainly the problem I have found is that people don't know how mm -hmm. to get into that arena. And so I have made that one of the things that I'm going to do here in the spring. And it's supposed, it's supposed I'm not sure of the date just yet, but we're going to engage at the ION and actually help people to be able to get their credentials and help them to be able to move forward. And one of the other things that I have uh, already done and I plan to continue, I'm trying to help people to uh, go to these workshops where they can have their records expunged because that is really, right. really helpful. Mm -hmm. They have gone in, they have served their time, mm -hmm. and now when they get ready, then they have to say, well, I went, I did this, and I did that. And you, they could be the greatest candidate. Yeah. And people put it in their mind, say, oh, no, we're not going to give them a chance. Yeah. It's too many people impacted by that. Yeah. And if we want to, the community to progress, we're going to have to get past all of that. Mm. I mean, you know, Forgiveness comes from above, okay? And so we're hoping that people are not so judgmental because I say there by the grace of God go I, yeah. right? Because we can all fall into a bad situation and then that happens and then we are totally discounted for the rest of our lives. And so that's very important to me that we have these expungement fears to help people who may want to go on and work for a company that would give them a problem. And then... What about their living conditions? If they have these records, then sometimes they can't live yeah. in good housing. And so you're relegating them to have to live in, in poor conditions because they have a record. Mm -hmm. And so these are things that we have to lift up and level the playing field, uh, particularly for people in my district, you know, uh, because traditionally a lot of people don't make money. We, you know, you know, we have a very diverse uh, economic base, mm -hmm. but certainly the masses of people are not making the money that they need to. And, you know, I, you know, they say money solves all things, but of course that's with the, with the caveat, uh, because it really doesn't, mm -hmm. uh, you know, cause they also say the love of money, uh, yeah, so is the of all root evil. of all evil. Mm -hmm. Right. And so we have to prepare people, help them to be able to become credit worthy. All of these things that have to go into place to level the playing field, for everybody, and the time is now to what, do it. What Carolyn is talking about, I think, is an example of what I meant on my third point of service. Okay. She's creating an avenue to help somebody else. And so she points out this real problem that we have in our community of people who have been incarcerated, people who are outside of the system, and how do we handle that? Well, the other side of that is, there are a lot of us who have a skill set where we can help people like that. Where is the cadre of young lawyers who are willing to go in and help people get their records expunged? 
Where is the cadre of social workers who are willing to sit with people and help them find jobs? We have to start creating this mindset that if we as a people are going to advance, it's more than just, I'm going to get mine mm -hmm. and I'm going to do the best that I can. It's how do we uplift the whole community? Because if we uplift the whole black community, we truly are uplifting America. Right. You know, and, 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 and I say this all the time. America is a monster that I love. Mm. And so I use that term, well, this monster we call America, but it's a monster that I love. And since I'm in this monster, how do we create a situation to make it better yep. for us and for everybody else? And a part of that for us has to be, we have to show the way. Mm. We have to use Dr. King's example of love and kindness and service to others. And so I'm, I'm glad that she's given these examples. I'm glad that this church over and over again services this community. I'm glad that there are young people like you, Amber, who are willing to take on the mantle of trying to help us educate ourselves about ourselves. We have to be a collective force moving forward. Amen. How do we get people involved in that service piece though? We have to keep talking to them. Well, of how course, do we get them to be passionate about it? Well, uh, if you meet people where they are, mm -hmm. yes, I think that they're more likely <clears throat> to engage. And of course, you know, on the service piece, you know, with services of rent we pay or something to paraphrase that to, you know, to exist. And I have lived by if I can help somebody as I pass along this way, then my living shall not be in vain. And so again, this is a calling for me. And uh, we are searching avenues of reaching people. This will be an avenue mm -hmm. of reaching people <laughs> to let them know that these things are happening. And in response to District D, I mean, they can sign up for the District D newsletter at mm -hmm. districtd.houstontx.gov. Mm -hmm. And then they will be privy to the information that I'm speaking about um, so that they will be in front of it and they can mark their calendars and they can certainly participate because what's very disheartening for me is it's just like a person that prepares a huge meal and nobody comes to eat, <laughs> right? It's like, what? And so we want to make sure that when we take all of this effort and pull in all of these resources, that people will know this is for me, please. We want you, I believe people want to do better, but they certainly need the tools to do better. And so as council member, I want to help to provide those tools. And so um, social media is a big thing. Yeah. You know, I use That's robocalls to call people and let them know things that are going on. But we want to use every means possible, by any means necessary, yeah. right? Yeah. To I, help yeah, people to engage, yeah, the, the, no to engage. The, the, the councilwoman makes a good point. You, you asked the question, how do we get people involved? How do we get them passionate? And she says, you have to meet people where they are. Mm -hmm. That is so true because most people respond to their particular problems. Mm -hmm. The reason that the Joy Floyd matter is a problem is because so many black people can see their children or their young black men being beat up and accosted by the police. So that becomes an issue. One of, the failing, one of the legacies of slavery that still exists for our people is the feeling that we don't have confidence that we can make change ourselves. And if we don't feel that we can make change, we don't feel that we want to take on the responsibility of trying to make change. So as we try to meet people where they are and identify these people, we also have to start creating a cultural mindset that we can make a difference. That it, it, it doesn't take somebody else to come and fix this problem for us. We can get after it and fix it ourselves. And we also need people who have made it. Oh yeah. To come back. That is your responsibility. And I don't mean come back and be condescending. Right. Yes. I mean, yes. come back and actually have a heart and a passion for helping people because in the, at the end of the day, if you help them, you have actually helped yourself. Because if you help them, then they're not sitting in your house cooking breakfast while you're at work uh, and, and participating in some of this criminal activity. And so, you know, that's one of the things, too, because 
a lot of times people feel like I've made it. Well, you know, they can make it too. But we have a responsibility to go back and pull somebody else with us, as many people as you can, because that changes not only, it ought to change how you feel inside yeah. as well. It ought to have an intrinsic value, but it certainly can have an extrinsic yeah. value in terms of what we are doing uh, to uplift our communities. Yeah. Okay. What are some challenges that you had to overcome in order to reach your ultimate goal? Well, let's, I don't know that I've reached my ultimate goal. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I'm still working on it. Yeah. I still think that I, even at my age, I, I'm a work in progress, if you will, because I set high goals. Mm -hmm. And the goal ultimately is to give as much of yourself to service for others. Yeah. And in doing that, you have to be prepared. And so I think the difficulty for me was I graduate high school, I come to the University of Houston, and I run into racial issues there. I graduate University of Houston, and I'm out of school for a long time, and then I go back to law school trying to get reacclimated. That was a positive experience for me, but it was coupled with a lot of hard work that made it possible. So the lesson that I would pass from that for me to, to the audience and people, it's never too late to start to try to move forward. And so the reason I say that I ain't ready to say I have met my goals right. is because I'm still working on them. And I think all of us ought to be working to make ourselves better as we move forward. Right. One of my challenges is somewhat personal, and that's realizing that I can't do everything. Yeah. <laughs> and the expectations are, because you're in a position, is that you can. Mm -hmm. uh, some people feel that, oh, you have this great amount of money where you can do this and that, which is not true, and it's also something that we have to do based on approval to get it done. And so, but one of my biggest challenges, challenges is divisiveness. And that's those things that we have created in our community based on you being young, I being older, uh, you having uh, resources, me not having them, you know. And so we have created yeah. Yeah. This, this chasm between each other as opposed to saying we are better together. Yep. I mean, truly put that in your mindset. I don't care how old a person is. Mm. If they're productive and they have great ideas, let's listen. Let's not just say, oh, the vessel is older, so I really don't want to hear from them. Or, by the same token, the vessel is younger. And so I don't think that they know enough mm -hmm. to be able to say that. That is so totally ridiculous because we all come from different experiences. We all have value. We all should have a seat at the table, but more importantly, we all need to respect each other. And that's what my biggest challenge is, to just uh, convey that divisiveness is not going to get us where we need to go. Yeah. And certainly we have to make sure that we try to engage as many people, you know, for whatever reason. You know, in, in the African-American community, that we have chasms even about the color. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Oh, she's light. He, mm -hmm. She thinks she's cute. Yep. I had to deal with that. I told, I was laughing the other day. I said, all my life I've needed to fight. <laughs> you know, I went to an inner city school. Yeah. Then at Jack Yates High School. So, of course, you know, oh, here she comes. Oh, she thinks she's this and that. Right. And then when they had a conversation with me, oh, they saw that I was as loud, as rambunctious as everybody <laughs> else. They realized that it was just what, oh, God, cool. clothed, yeah. it's what God clothed me in. Right. And I'm going to do what I can. I thank him for it, whatever you I have, so but good. certainly we have to stop the divisiveness and respect each other. And I think that we could go a long, long way mm. just in that, if yeah. we could meet that challenge. Love that. Yeah. Do you have anything else to add? Uh, no, I think she's, uh, she's <laughs> spot on. Yeah. She's spot on. Yeah. yeah. All right. Last question. What is it that you want your legacy to be? Oh, that's very easy for me. I want it to be said that I helped somebody. Yeah. Again, if I can help somebody as I pass along this way, then my living shall not be in vain. Mm -hmm. I, you know, people come up to me all the time and my mind, I never forget 
what they asked me for. Mm-hmm. I may not be able to provide it at that time, but God and his omnipotence, he always presents an opportunity after somebody has come to me and said, well, you know, I'm homeless or this is happening to me, you know, always make sure I can contact them. And then somebody always comes up to me and they say, well, I have this program. I have this. Do you have people? And so if I can help somebody as I pass along this way, then my living shall not be in vain. Amen. Yeah. For me, is I'd like the people to say he was a good person. Not that his politics were good, <laughs> not that his cars or his house were mm-hmm. good, not that he was a good lawyer, but he was a good person. And that means that I tried to help somebody along the way. Absolutely. It means that I had a certain level of character and integrity. It means that I was humble, that I worked hard, that I was not self-entitled, and that I loved my family and that 